Hello and welcome to the Most Talk Podcast. This is Connor O'Boyle. Okay, this is the second episode of the LA series and today I'll be speaking with Chris Jacobson. Chris is a re-recording engineer and sound effects editor and has worked on numerous films such as Independence Day Resurgence, All's the Great and Powerful, The Hurt Locker, Battle Los Angeles and Drag Me to Hell to name a few. He's recently moved over to television and has worked on a number of hit shows such as Netflix's A Series of Unfortunate Events and Mozart in the Jungle for which he's been nominated for an Emmy. Chris and I get into his side of the business and talk about developments in audio such as multidimensional sound, Atmos, DTSX, or 3 d which Chris was a part of. And we get into the state of the industry and how he handles the different audio elements in a movie, uh, how he works with the directors, and much more. So, without further preamble, I give you Chris Jacobson. So, I am here in the Dubbing Brothers studio in North Hollywood in LA, and I am with Chris Jacobson. Chris, how are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, and uh, so tell me, Chris, what is it that you actually do? Um, right now, oh, I, I work in post-production sound. I've done every aspect of it, but primarily right now I'm a re-recording mixer. Okay. So that's kind of the final stop when it comes to sound. We gather basically everything that's been created up to that point, whether it be you know dialogue recorded on the set, uh, music scored, uh, sound effects created or recorded somewhere, Foley's recorded at a, at a studio, and some backgrounds are laid in, you know, uh, and I will take, uh, as a re-recording mixer, I will take those elements and mix them together and kind of choose what's going to be featured, uh, sometimes choose stuff to drop that maybe doesn't need to be in, you know, for the, to tell that story, we can drop certain elements. Sometimes it could be music, sometimes it could be, uh, you know, dialogue is just not needed in a scene. I mean, that's rare that dialogue would be dropped, if, 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 especially if you see lips moving. So tell me uh, how you specialize in, in movies and television and visual media. Um, but tell me, what's your background? How did you arrive there? Did you come from uh, like pop rock records or like what, what's your kind of your, your back story? How did you arrive at this point? So I'm a, I'm a guitar player and I started, you know, pretty young as you know even before teen I think maybe in eighth grade I started playing guitar and played in bands and um, came to Los Angeles to go to Musicians Institute uh, to do the guitar program performance uh, guitar performance and um, so I did that it was like a year year long program at the time and did that and that's what I thought I wanted to do was was be a, mu- uh, a musician and travel and you know do the touring thing and all that playing bands and um, as I was kind of trying to do that, or right after school, actually, I got an internship at a music studio. I thought, well, while I'm, you know, working on my music career, I can record music, you know, kind of, and it, yeah. it'll benefit me because I'll have access to the to the studio to record my own stuff and mm-hmm. and so on. I come to find out I don't really care for recording music so much, at least the type of clients we were doing. It was a lot of really low, low end stuff, low budget, you know, yeah. guy an acoustic guitar or, uh, you know, someone wants to sing over a karaoke tape or... Right, right. Basically things that are done at home studios nowadays. Kind of, yeah. I mean, some of it, there was some pro, pro stuff and some of the pro stuff was a little funner. I mean, we had a lot of hip hop stuff, which I wasn't crazy for. And yeah. um, we had some bigger acts that would come in, uh, sometimes a Nashville thing or something. That'd be a very uh, uh, a learning experience to see how meticulous they are right. uh, you know I'd be a second assist a second engineer on, on stuff like that mm-hmm. you know I started out as an intern and became a second engineer and then eventually became an engineer but didn't do a whole lot of on the engineering side because we were at the time starting to get into post-production okay. and doing you know post for really low budget independent films mm-hmm. and I kind of liked that more and so I pursued that side of it it paid a little more and it was just you know, you, you get left alone in a room to cut away and do your thing, you know, a yeah. good part of the time. And so I, I learned along with the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a couple, there was a music editor there who's, who was, uh, you know, big time music editor, works on big features. And he kind of helped us, taught us some things. And there was also another guy who was a very experienced dialogue editor who taught me some things. So I got to 
basically get a taste of every aspect on really low budget stuff. So it'd be like cutting effects, maybe recording some Foley, right. even walking some Foley, um, even mixing a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I got started, and then it just went from there. You know, I, I over the years I have done every aspect in this industry, okay. for, as far as sound, you know, post sound is concerned. So w walk us through some of those aspects. Um, you know, when you when you talk about I've done every aspect uh, of sound. So you're talking about um, you've been involved in music, you've been involved in sound effects, you've been involved in dialogue. What other kind of um, areas of, of film would you tend to um, find yourself with most? Mo like what I've done the most? Yeah. Probably sound effects editorial and mixing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk us through what, what would be the typical, um, what, what, where in the, you, you're the last stop in the process, right? Yeah, if I'm mixing, I will tend to be the last stop. If I'm editing, I'll come on a little earlier um, it's usually kind of during the, the picture editorial process that the sound will, will come on. Um, occasionally things can uh, start earlier, but it's pretty rare that that happens. I mean, I haven't been on any too many projects I th that I can think of that have started like before they've stopped shooting even. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be after they're done shooting and they're in, well into the editorial process, usually maybe getting close to uh, the director's cut, and they'll bring us on to say, temp, do temp sound for the director's cut which means we got to cut all the sound effects, get maybe get some foley, uh, you know, get the dialogue smoothed out editorial wise and uh, maybe a few lines of ADR just to cover their bases, you know, get the most important stuff. And then we'll do a quick, you know, two, three day, it ranges, but usually like a th say a three day temp mix, what they call. And then that will be presented uh, at, a, at a theater in front of a, a, a preview audience, what they call, you know, sometimes you see those people on the street trying to get you to come see a preview. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, that's usually what that is, is a, is a test screening of, mm -hmm. of the film, of the director's cut, and that's to give the studio kind of an idea of where they are with the picture, if it's in a good place, if it's getting in the right direction. Okay. Uh, after that, sometimes they fire the editor and <laughs> hire a new guy on to recut the thing, or, you know, really depends on the project. Right. And, Sometimes it's really, you know, score is really good, but they still want to mess around with it. Mm -hmm. So then what after the director's cut, there'll often be the studio cut. Right. Okay. So tell us about this sort of idea of, um, of cutting pieces of, of existing material. So say, for example, you're working on, um, you know, a project where you are, are you, in conversation with the the music the composer or do you like are you there at the recording studio or do you not see any of that until they deliver stems to you or how does that work yeah we're rarely in touch with the composer or the you know maybe the music editor and it depends on the project usually during the temp phase they're just using maybe the composer's prior works, possibly if they have a composer even picked at that point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't. And uh, if they don't, they're just using whatever, you know, they have, you know, right. usually editors have a pretty vast library of, of CDs or they bring in a music editor mm -hmm. who has a huge, you know, library of various composers and they just cut, you know, various things together for the director. Sometimes the director's actually picking music as well, you know, mm -hmm. if it's, um, you know, it, it all depends. So yeah, we rarely have direct contact with the composer mm -hmm. during these projects. Um, usually, the the music editor is kind of the liaison between between us. They're kind of there to represent the composer and right, right. and kind of communicate with us. So obviously, in 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 film uh, movies, dialogue is king. This is what we're we're told. This um, kind of from day one that. The music should never get in the way. It should never because you, the re-recording engineer, will just pull it down, or the director will say, "What's that? Why is that there?" So, if we're writing, for example, um, you know, uh, we would never write for an instrument that occupies the same range as the as the dialogue. We would always write. So, if it's a female, we would write low. Uh, if it's a male, we would probably set it high above it, or around it in some way 
uh, if if we're in at all. Yeah, um, that's that's great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So that, that's kind of that's kind of like uh, one hundred and one that you di- dialogue is king. That's that's. What I have to say, say, not all composers think of that. Right. And we've had some where they, they just it's like they don't even listen to dialogue. They mm-hmm. it's like they're watching picture with the, the volume turned all the way down and right. they're just scoring what they want to. Sure. That happens. I've spoken <laughs> to some composers and they've. They've been very, um, you know, they don't speak very highly of of temp music in general. They say, like, um, you know, I don't want to have a ref. I don't want a reference because it'll it'll dictate where I go in terms of my instrument choices or, you know. But then um, it has the flip side because you know where where you should stay out of the way. So you're you kind of walking that tight little tightrope. But tell me, tell me about some sort of anecdotal, or if you've any experience with with a case that you've had to you know deal with music that's that's not been written well, and you've had to pull it back down. Or has there any, been any any um, kind of experiences where you've had to really work hard to get it to to work to get it work to picture? Yeah, I just to touch on you mentioned the temp thing, and that's. That's a really there's a lot of love hate in that in the the whole industry. I mean, there's it's it's really hard <laughs> because yeah. it 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 affects us on say when it, oh, I'm I'm primarily on the sound effects side, mm-hmm. so I don't do music as much or dialogue, right. but it definitely affects us on on that side as well. That whole temp because there's a what we call temp love, mm-hmm. the and it can happen with uh, you know most often it's happening with uh, with music. Say mm-hmm. say there's it is even a song or something that they use from a popular artist and they're in love with that song yeah. and it's going to cost a lot of money you know they're going to spend a hundred thousand plus on on licensing that song and it's like that hundred thousand dollars could be used for right. you know to make the sound better but here they are blowing it on yeah. on a on a license that's right because they're hearing they're hearing and they're 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 watching the same scene or the same kind of you know sequence of of the movie over and over and over again and every time they they see them that scene they're they're hearing that music that they've that they've placed in there yeah they're so, ex- they're expecting it and right. we uh, we have the same thing happen with sound effects sometimes an editor will put in there sometimes it's decent sometimes it's not so good there might be mm-hmm. like some canned door effect even or something right. that they just throw in from generic library mm-hmm. and they're in love with that sound for whatever reason just and we have to use it it right. happens Right, and this is the the director we're talking about here. Director or, or producers. editors often have a lot of pull as well. Right, and stuff like that. Interesting, interesting. It was, we we would always hear that the director would be the one that has that sort of temp love uh, syndrome, this type of idea that uh, uh, it's good. What what you've written is good, but 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 I want it to be more like. Like what you what 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 that one is there that's that's already in the sh- in yeah the, that's the why they gave the guide right 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 <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean what's great yeah it is great if you get a composer in early and they can do mock-ups mm-hmm. I mean that's probably the best of you know I know they're not the quality that you'd want for a final but at least you know something that they can work with in the, the yeah. during the temps so uh, take us through like the, the 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 general process from when you come on board to when you you're kind of you're finished and you're saying that's that's me i'm i'm out of here yeah it depends on the project but um if i'm cutting on a project and there's been a few that i've i've cut on as well as mixed right so do you want to give us any examples of anything that you've worked Say, on drag or? drag me to hell for instance okay. um i did cut a lot of sound effects on that i was on it for maybe three months and then there was a hiatus i think they had to reshoot some stuff right. and then and then when it was like maybe a couple months two three months later we came back to mix the final Mm -hmm. i wasn't involved after after the initial three months that i was doing editorial i wasn't involved in the editorial after that the sound effects editorial Mm -hmm. um they kind of had a change in in the supervisor uh we had they had to have another supervisor take over and and um i just wasn't i didn't get involved in after that point but so yeah i worked for like three months cutting sound effects on it and then took a break and then came back and started mixing. So then, you know, and then on the mix side, we would uh, jump into what we call pre-dubs. Mm-hmm. There was no temps on Drag Me to Hell from what I recall. I mean, he did, 
So what happened is we did, we started pre-dubbing and I think I had like seven days or something like that to pre-dub. It's a, I don't remember exactly, maybe seven reels. It was, mm -hmm. it wasn't super long, but it wasn't super short either. Mm -hmm. um, but we got plenty of time to, to do our pre-dubs. Uh, we pre-dubbed so in separate what locations. Are, what are pre-dubs? Can you, can you walk us through, f um, you know, these, these kind of terms that you're using? Sure. So what, what is a pre-dub? Yeah, so... When I get handed a, a session for, say, a reel of dra the first real one of Drag Me to Hell, um, it might be hundreds of tracks of stuff. You know, I've got backgrounds, I've got hard effects, I've got some sound design elements, and I've got Foley. And I can't just put that all up and let it play. Um, and, you know, so you don't want to sit there on day one with the client in the room, the producers and the director in the room and just hit play because it's not, it's just not ready to present. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is, um, and I don't know where the, all the bodies lie, basically. I don't know where that loud, you know, say gunshot is or whatever it is, or, you know, say those demon screams in, in the real first reel of Drag Me to Hell. I would have to go hunting for that, you know, and it's going to take time to do that. So rather than do it that way, I get to basically sit with it for say a day approximately and go through all the elements. And I kind of do it in a or somewhat organized manner where I'll go through, say, the backgrounds. And I'll have a, a dialogue to mix against. So hopefully the dialogue mixer, in this case it was Marty Humphrey here at the dub stage, he would be working on dialogue on, up here while I was down at Sony mixing the effects. And so I would get a reel from him of dialogue finished, not finished, but pre-dubbed. So he's doing the same thing as I'm doing. He's kind of going through the elements and pre-dubbing it. So I would get a that uh, basically a crash down or a bounce of that dialogue and I'd get to mix against it. Okay. And so it'd get, that'd give me a good starting point of where we should be level wise. You know, I never, never want to step on dialogue. You were talking earlier how yeah. dialogue is king. And even in a film like Drag Me to Hell where it's a pretty heavy sound effects show, dialogue's still king, you know, yeah. so. I get that and I put up my backgrounds and I'll start to kind of sort through those and pan them around. It's panning and level, maybe some EQ here and there if I need to. And then I'll go through, say, the Foley, the footsteps, the hand pats, mm -hmm. the, you know, handling things. And um, I'll go through that against a dialogue. And then, you know, I'll do the hard effects, say car driving and, uh, you know, uh, bus by, uh, mm -hmm. slaps you know, someone getting slapped or something, you know, yeah. bigger yeah. kind of sync sounds. And then the last thing I'll probably do is kind of like the spice on top is the sound design elements, right. Right. which are, you know, sometimes it's very ethereal, almost verging on, it's almost verging on kind of musical type things sometimes, but usually it's atonal if it's sound design. It's right. not, it's not going to be uh, in a particular key or anything. No. So it usually will work okay with music, depending if it is a tonal thing, then maybe we'll have a conflict there, and I'll have to I'll have to broom something. But um, and that's usually the last element I put in. That that will also include uh, creatures that are created, say the demon voices. Those were created in the right. sound design. That's very like specific stuff for the movie that are created. You know, usually from scratch, or you know, maybe they brought in a, a voice talent to create some of those sounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then. Then the director and producers come in and they get their first look at what it's like when the pre-dubs are synced. Yeah, so at that point we were both pre-dubbed and we get what we call the final mix. Mm -hmm. On day one we're getting music for the first time. Right. Uh, usually music is, is pretty backed up. You know, they're... they're um, usually have pretty tight deadlines and they're like mixing they're basically mixing they're doing the scoring mix as we're you know pre-dubbing and then on day one they maybe start delivering some reels mm -hmm. and so on day one we'll get reel one put it up with our material and and actually start to run everything together at that point right. okay. and uh you know overall to kind of do overall levels of of music uh, at first and then kind of fine-tune it from there right so you don't deal with um synth masters as opposed to pre-records that's not what you you don't deal with um so for example um if i were to give you the the session files from from the scoring stage right i've, I've taken my music and i've have it recorded and uh i would have them mixed by my mix engineer before they would go to you to be mixed into the movie, right? Typically, yeah. Um, so 
this idea that when you get the music, is it it's not in one consolidated file, it's it's in sections or is it do you get all the stems? Yeah, so they'll still be splits. Say um, there might be an orchestra 5.0 mm-hmm. or it might be a 5.1 if the mixer actually derived a, a LFE from that. Uh, there'll be maybe some string overdub um, tracks and those could be those could be stereo or they could be 5.1. It really depends on, on the session, how it was recorded and everything. Uh, there could be some synth stuff in there and those will be on their own tracks and there's some maybe a percussion. But you're not but you're not necessarily getting each individual instrument and its own stem. You're not getting like violin one. No. Um, you'll be getting sections, like you'll be getting the strings, the yeah, brass. Yeah, what it what it is is it's it's mixed and then they are presented in kind of stems so that we have some control maybe not all the control because uh, you know we tend to not need all the control yeah, I, but enough control that we can say hey you know we want that choir to be louder and we want to pan that overhead right. or you know back into the room right because or- i also heard that you know in terms of uh from a composer's point of view because uh, they would always be thinking about how their music is going to be presented in the final form and obviously um, with today's the way the film world is today, directors tend to not want themes, or they don't want melodies. You know, this sort of old style of writing is not really in vogue at the minute. Um, so what they would do is they would pick their moments to present sort of some sort of short thematic material. Um, obviously, when there's no dialogue, maybe in a montage scene or. But in terms of having their material the way that the composer uh, originally envisioned it, that the du- the dub engineer's not, um, you know, pushing the the percussion up too loud because the director wants you know aggression or he wants it to feel tense or something. You know what I mean? So this is the way the piece is written and this is it's balanced well. And so uh, they would always say that we would give them sections, but not so much control within the sections. So if the if the director says, "Oh, I want more percussion," he can push all the percussion up rather than just have the bass hit, you know, because uh, he wants or she wants the uh, the bass hit. Yeah, I mean, we get varying levels of control on Oz the Great and Powerful. We had, I mean, it was like sixty wide or something, and they were f- a lot of five O stems, right. so it was super wide. On some projects, it might be like one 5 orchestra and then a bunch of synth stuff, you know, maybe 10 tracks of synth stuff. Right. Um, you know, it varies a lot, obviously. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so there's definitely var- varying levels of control. And this is all mixed, at least how the composer wants to present it. Right. Um, at least in relation to itself, you know, like the elements within, it's not necessarily mixed with dialogue and right. and fully. So what we'll do is take like an overall level pass of say pulling down the music so that it's mm-hmm. not stomping on dialogue or, you know, maybe at certain points it is featured and other times it's yeah. brought down to let the dialogue come through or maybe some sound effects mm-hmm. to come through or whatever. So yeah, it's kind of overall kind of presented as it was leveled. And then, you know, after maybe that initial pass, we'll go in there and start to tweak stuff a little more, maybe right. repan some stuff or, you know, uh, yeah. bring out certain elements that, that are wanted. You know, this director will have an idea, you know, I want that, you know, flute there to peak a little bit, you know, because mm-hmm. it's really matching something on screen. Right. So would you would you go in and actually automate the, the files? Like, would you... Oh, yeah, yeah, them? it's all, it's definitely all automated. Yeah, so you would create, like, additional movement that's a red... Like, so the orchestra is doing their doing their thing right the orchestra's doing their their crescendos and their diminuendos and they're they're bringing that that movement and that motion into the music naturally but then you want to take that a step further in terms of how the music is moving in relation to the sound effects and the dialogue right. yeah so you, sometimes you, you would automate in addition to the the yeah it, it all depends it really depends sometimes you are you know say it's a hit a big hit and you are pushing it even more to make it even bigger right. sometimes you're maybe pulling it back a little bit maybe it got the orchestra got too big there and you're pulling it back just a little bit right right so as it builds you're just taking that and shaping it to to work in the in relation to what's happening on screen right right yeah i mean ultimately it's what's 
it's the movie and the story that's trying to be told and, and the director, what their vision is. And I mean, you know, Victor, the director has the final say, yeah. but you know, you're really trying to just tell the story that's on the screen. You're not um, too caught up on the individual elements, hopefully, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes I have sound effects that I love and sometimes they just gotta get lost. Okay, so let's, you, you've mentioned a few um, kind of terminologies that I would like to, to touch on. Um, You've, you've talked about 5.1 and 5.5.0 and this type of, this type of language. Um, it's language that we hear quite frequently, but language that's not necessarily fully understood by everyone. So what is it when you talk about 5.1 or when you talk about 5.0 and you talk about LFEs and this type of language? Can you, can you kind of articulate yeah. what, that, so, what that means? So for years, at least 10 plus years, it's been pretty common uh, probably 20 years or more, it's been pretty common to mix in, in 5.1 format, which is a surround. Mm -hmm. You know, you have left, center, right, and then you have left surround, right surround, mm -hmm. and then you have the LFE track, which mm -hmm. is the sub. Yep. And um, sometimes, like when I say 5.0 or 5.1, it's a 5.0 with, 5.0 would be no LFE in it. Mm -hmm. And that's say maybe an orchestra, because you know, you don't really record an LFE in, when you're recording right. orchestra, so it might be a, it could be j as simple as the uh, three mics and, and a couple uh, ambient mics in the back or something. Right, like a dagger you know, tree setup. Yeah, or something it like could that, be as know. simple as that, but it's usually a mix down of, say, everything that was there on the uh, when they did the the orchestra. You know, mm -hmm. it can be spot mics and the deca tree and some ambience mics, and right. and it's up to the. You know, we don't tend to deal with all that ourselves. It's that tends to go to the scoring mixer, who kind of condenses that into a more consolidated yeah file, consolidated you know, yeah. files for you know usually some five o's and right. some stereos and stuff like that okay so you're talking about that that is a speaker layout right yeah it's more of a channel layout right. but yeah i mean you could say speaker layout because i mean you can take a five o and use it in a seven one format as well mm -hmm. i mean it's mm -hmm. you got to kind of play with it a little bit but you know right right so most movies for the past 20 years have been in this sort of um, five one seven one system, yeah, seven one is a little more recent. Maybe right. in the last five years, maybe a little long, maybe ten years, and and but it's still not you know the most common. I'd say still say five one is still right. very so common. When, when you go to the cinema on a on a on a Wednesday evening or whatever, you're experiencing sound there in typically in five one, right? Probably, yeah. Just it depends on the market and. I'm talking. I'm talking about just average guy yeah. going to his local cinema. I'm not talking about any sort of big IMAX cinema or something like that. We're we're talking. Mm -hmm. So they're they're generally experiencing sound in five one. Yeah, usually five one or maybe seven one. So how is that different in terms of of experiencing the sound from a stereo image? Um, if I was listening to a, a record on headphones, for example, is can you talk us through how the the sound that we experience is different there and why it matters in cinema? Yeah, there's just more more separation, first of all, and there's more room for everything. You know, in a stereo, you're gonna be cramming everything into two speakers. And when you have five speakers to deal with, or even six, it's, you have, there's more space in there to, in, and it allows you to, you know, you can have some stuff in the center, say, you know, more the heavier stuff, dialogue and, and maybe percussion sometimes and bass mm -hmm. and maybe a vocal you know some of the more prominent stuff is going to be in the center and then maybe yeah strings strings you might spread around the, the through between the front lcr or maybe you even pull it into the room a little bit to fill the room um and then you kind of ha tend to have some of the ambiences and the surrounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh cool. some of the reverb and so when people are listening to a, a pop record or um or you know, just an, an OST, for example, like a soundtrack album, as opposed to going to see the movie with the music. Because sometimes there's variation in right. in what's in the film as opposed to what's the composer puts on the on the soundtrack release. So uh, when when people experience the the, the 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 difference in the the soundtrack to the to the cinema, that's the choices that you make. Uh, in terms of where things are placed in the in the stereo, in the not the stereo field, but in the the image that you present, right? Kind of. I mean, it starts with the scoring mixer. They make some of those choices as far as you know 
where the strings are going to go and you know mm -hmm. i mean it's usually light, usually so. based on how it's laid out on the on the on the record you know mm -hmm. the, uh, with the orchestra but um yeah sometimes we make decisions to pull say oftentimes we'll take choir and bring it into the room into the surrounds or even uh, with the newer formats the immersive formats we put it above so it's right. like this floating you know, voice of God thing <laughs> going on above you. But would you add, for example, extra reverb, or would you not touch the what what's been what's been given? It, re to you? it really depends, and it, and it's sometimes the taste of the director and the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're working with, say, Sam Raimi and Bob Morawski, they're pretty particular about the ambience of the room that the orchestra was mm -hmm. re recorded in, and they often don't want additional stuff added on top. But then sometimes maybe there's an edit that needs to be helped and you want to push a little reverb in there to help the edit. Um, and then sometimes you have recordings that maybe weren't in a big hall and you want to emulate the sound of a, of a big hall. And so you're, you're adding reverb to that. I mean, it, it really depends. I mean, a lot of that's done by the scoring mixer as well, but it depends. You know, sometimes we don't have a, a scoring mixer involved in yeah. the project. So Yeah, I mean, um, there's so many people that the process has to go through before it gets... So there's so every as it goes through the process, there are everybody's coming and bringing their own interpretation and their own. I think that's the thing that people don't really, when when they go to see the final product of a movie, they don't understand the the the, the amount of people that have had creative input uh, to get it to what's the final product. Um, you know, so how many people have conflicting ideas about how things should be? It's like, ah, oh, that's too wet. You know, can we can we take that can we take that back and make it drier or, um, you know, these types of things. Uh, but you were talking about these kind of more modern um, technologies that are coming out now. So we're we're talking about these types of things like Atmos and DTSX, which is where we sort of uh, came in contact. So you specialize or you have experience in working with these new platforms. They're not new, but they're relatively new. Well, yeah, I, I had experience with them when they were new, when <laughs> you they know, were new, right, when right. they were even before they were released to the so, public, you know. Right. So how long has, because Atmos and, and uh, Dolby Atmos and, and DTS and these types of things are slowly but surely creeping into home cinema at the minute. Um, but for a while, they were pretty uh, exclusive to uh, theater cinema. and But you, like you said, have been... Uh, involved before they were even there so can you talk us about talk to us about how um, this is the next step in cinema sound and and what it actually is yeah it really just brings another level of immersiveness to the storytelling mm -hmm. allows the director to place the audience more in in the location or you know in the story basically right and how does it work or what's the kind of technology behind yeah, it? yeah there's um the main the main gist of it is that there's objects that are basically individual sound elements that are uh, that we can place anywhere in the room th in a 3D field, you know, rather than just on on a 2D field, which is 5.1 is really just 2D, mm -hmm. two dimensional. You know, there's no Y axis on that. It's just X. I mean, there's no Z axis. It's just X Y. Um, so now we can place elements up above our heads, which gives it a little more immersiveness. Mm -hmm. But it's also more precise panning and in, in these individual elements that can kind of go down the side wall. Right. So even in the 2D plane, it's more precise where you're placing it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, especially with movement, it gives you a little more movement than, than you could in the past. Right. And this is, this is kind of specifically uh, helpful or useful when you're dealing with like uh, hard, uh, hard hits that you were talking about before, like cars moving past or airplanes and you want to simulate this idea of like an airplane moving over the over the head that you can actually pass that sound through the space of the audience, right? Yeah, uh, bullet buys, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, alien spaceships flying overhead. You know, there's there's lots of you know thunder rumbling up in the sky. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, instances that we can use this. It's also useful for spreading things around to to even just get it off the front of the screen right. and maybe get it a little more into the room mm -hmm. like uh you know music can be brought into the uh front front side speakers a little bit mm -hmm. that's often done and so it's not like in the surrounds it's still towards the front 
but it's off the main screen channels. Right. It doesn't feel as flat. It doesn't feel as like um, because obviously the 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 cinema has evolved from the theater, right? That's obviously where cinema came from, and audiences for hundreds of years seen the 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 the, the action on the stage and the, the or, or the pit orchestra below, mm-hmm. the same way that we would experience um, you know a, a Broadway musical today, right? You would go. And you would see the the performance on the stage above, which would be eye level, and then the, the music would be kind of coming from this 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 place that doesn't exist. The the world that the actors are creating, the, the orchestra doesn't exist there. Um, so, but what you're doing is that you're taking it away from that that historical way that audiences have always digested cinema, because cinema is just an extension of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're now bringing the the music or the orchestra further into the room where they've always been in that that pit space right that's yeah that's part of it uh, i think i think with uh you know that fad for a while it's not so as popular anymore but the whole 3d visuals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh you know that was big you know, they were really pushing it there for a while and i think that's where kind of sound felt like well we need to take it to the next level as well mm-hmm. and but you don't need 3D visuals to have this immersive sound, this 3D sound. Right. So, um, because there is stuff that happens, you know, even if you're looking at a flat screen 2D image, you can still imagine stuff that's happening off screen to the yeah. right or off screen to the left or above you or, or behind you. Mm-hmm. So that's where the, the 3D audio comes in. Right, right. And is, is there any uh, particular movies that you've worked on that have used this type of... Um you know, is there any sort of experience that you have um, where where you've had to actually that you can talk about? We did this specifically to create this effect, or um, or is there any sort of projects that you've not necessarily worked on, but that you that you've experienced or know about that have utilized these sort of techniques to simulate that that experience? We did Oz the Great and Powerful in Oro 3D. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't have a chance to do the Atmos version. That was uh, kind of happening concurrently, and we just couldn't do it if that was happening at Disney. And so we did the Oro version here at the dub stage. And we, like the whole tornado in the beginning of the sh- of the film, I mean, we had stuff flying all around us and above us and below us. And I mean, not really below us. There's no speakers below us, but you know that feeling. The sub usually is what kind of what you use to kind of perceive something below you, but just. I mean, it was it was amazingly immersive. I mean, it sounded incredible. Uh, it was really fun to work on that. It was a lot of a lot of hard work. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that that we've had a lot of fun with. So the tornado, the the, the I think the classic scene is the the cow comes past. There's always like this tornado, and the you hear the you know the, the cow comes past, and you, you so you could simulate that moving through the room, right, as the tornado sweeps right. by. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's there's all kinds of stuff whipping around and things flying by and. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I forgot about the cow. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just typically whenever I think of a tornado movie, that's always seems to be a, a trope that that <laughs> follows through there. But we we also had the fun kind of thing to the uh, that was an homage to the original was mm-hmm. when it opened up. It was a four by three black and white, and when it opened up to wide screen and color, mm-hmm. it was pretty much a musical moment at that point. But we the whole first reel and a half was mixed in mono. We prepared it in full because we weren't sure we were going to go that direction. And when we talked about it, you know, Sam was interested in going that direction, but we we're like, well, we're not sure if it's going to work. So let's prepare, you know, mix everything as if it's because uh, we mixed that one in seven one initially. Mm-hmm. And so let's mix it in the full surround. And then we'll, you know, if we need to, we can easily collapse it down to mono. Right. And that's what we ended up doing was collapse it down to mono. And then Everything just opens up when that when the uh, when it opens up from black and white to right, color, right. and the, so the screen opens up. You're moving essentially into modernity at that point, right? You know, the we're here in the modern world mm-hmm. as opposed to the the kind of classical sort of space that it would have been endured by not endured but enjoyed by audiences uh, before. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so that that's really interesting. Um, Talk to me about, um, I've, I went out on, on uh, Facebook before we did this and I, I asked some people, uh, did they have any sort of questions that that um, they would want me to ask? So 
uh, one of the questions that that I that I got asked was um, to be an engineer, to be a, a mixing engineer. Um, how important is it to have a knowledge of the musical language um, or a knowledge of music? Like, what to what extent do you need to be musical? I I think that's very helpful. I don't think you need to be. I mean, there's a lot of people in this in- industry that come from musical backgrounds. Mm-hmm. I have a musical background, and and there's some people that can even read music. But I I don't think it's totally necessary to get to that kind of level but to have a familiarity with music and um, I think it I think it can help I don't I don't know that it's completely necessary there are plenty of people that don't have a musical background that mm-hmm. that do just fine in the, in this industry but yeah I don't think it's totally necessary though I mean you definitely have this sort of um, this sort of duality between uh, the sound world of music these days you've got the the traditionalists the, the sort of John Williams um, people that are that are producing essentially uh, only orchestral music, and then you have the the Hans Zimmer's of the world that are um, producing these sort of hybrid um, scores that that it's hard to distinguish where the music ends and the sound design begins, or the the sound design is equally as important in the composition than the than the the, the orchestra is and. Then on the other end of the extreme, you've got the the Trent Reznor's of the world that are that are just producing these electronic scores that have essentially no conventional orchestra in them whatsoever. So I mean, you 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 have to have some sort of uh, appreciation for the the stylistic nature of what has been presented in the in the movie, I suppose, right? Mixing. Uh, you know the social network in all of its electronic ness is not the same as mixing Star Wars presumably right yeah no it's a definitely a different different beast um, to me I mean orchestral scores fit better mm-hmm. for some reason I think they're easier to not, I shouldn't say easy but they're easier to mix than a say an electronic score um, I mean we've dealt with both and and sometimes because electronic scores are, are really they can be full frequency they're taking up every every band and and it's like hard to get a sound effect through or you know right right because they they usually like use sound effects as well right yeah be, no that's true there'll be um you know design work in amongst those those uh-huh. types of scores um you know but another question that that they that they asked was you know does it is it necessary or or um, how important or helpful is it to play an instrument in terms of being a, a, a mixing engineer? Or uh, yeah, I mean it's a similar answer to the other one. I think it's it's very. Uh, I think it's helpful. I mean, just to give you an example of, I, I don't think in musical terms necessarily, but I think when I'm say designing something in the uh, a, say a battle of gunshots and it has a certain rhythm or a certain cadence you know what I mean it, I'm not necessarily thinking of it but I feel it and right. I think that musicality kind of comes through mm-hmm. sometimes tempo yeah it could be a tempo thing or just the way the, the phrasing of it or you know what I mean I think some of that stuff comes through when you're right. designing something or even mixing something it can kind of you know yeah because even actors uh, they talk about beats don't they they talk about the beat of a scene and the it's always to do with the pacing of the narrative and everything in that sort of language of, of movies uh, and television is is a that the, the pacing is is it is it a slow or is it a is it a really fast pacing um, you know and and everything will will be dictated by that you know the the tempo of the music the tempo of the effects that are coming you know so your slaps or your punches um, you know they'll they'll always be sort of reflective of of the, the tempo of what's happening and I think in that respect coming from a musical background or having an appreciation of music is, uh, is a, an extra tool to to be used there right yeah I think so it definitely doesn't hurt and, and can help um, I mean a lot of this the tempo of, of or the pacing is kind of um, it's usually dictated by the editor how they how they want things to flow, mm-hmm. but I think you can put your, you know, rather than just going pat pat pat, 
you know, it could be pap, pap, pap. You know what right, I mean? It could right. be just a slightly different right. variation on the sounds that makes it more interesting. Right. And and let's just talk about that for a second. So how how detailed do you go? Let's let's talk about footsteps, for example. Would you use a different footstep sound or uh, would you use the same footstep sound? Um, you know, how, how would you... Footsteps are usually walked by an artist. Right, okay. So and not. they're, they're I mean, everything we're doing is, is very detailed. And they're going to they're gonna look at the shoes and not always use the exact type of shoe, but they want it to sound like that's what they're using. You know, sometimes that shoe that they're walking with may not sound good. So they're like, well, let's do something a little different that right. sounds a little better. But they're going to try to match shoes, the surface, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's hardwoods, you know, uh, carpet, uh, linoleum, yeah, sand, concrete, asphalt. You know what I mean? They're going to really try to match the surface, and and there's a lot of details within the sound that are captured. You know, there's scuffs on you know the foot, kind of gets a little grittiness on it. Some some sand underneath uh, in the concrete, you know, type of thing. And you know, so there's a lot of detail there for sure. I don't have to deal with every individual footstep, luckily, but I you know I do mix in say you know there's a track for that character and a track mm -hmm. for the next character, and I'm mixing that. And sometimes if it sounds a little off, I might need to EQ it or tweak it a little bit or right. maybe the timing's a little off if you know if an editor hasn't looked at it you know on tv we often get stuff handed to us that hasn't been meticulously edited you know i'm used to stuff that's been almost every footstep is matched in sync pretty much if right. you see it on screen maybe if you see only their shoulder maybe not every footstep is exactly on where it needs to be but you know if you're seeing the footsteps it's gonna be every footsteps gonna be exact yeah. But on TV, we often get stuff that's just in the ballpark, and, and sometimes you can be six, eight frames off. Mm -hmm. And when I notice it, then I'll, I'll I'll tweak it and try to make it the sync better. Mm -hmm. But we just we just don't have enough time when sure. it comes to TV to deal with stuff like that. Right, and and uh, footsteps and the same principle applies across the board. I mean, for punches and typically, you know, we we would we're used to the sound effects not representing reality. You know, when, when people yeah. get punched, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking like the Bourne mm -hmm. movie or something, for example, where, you know, Matt Damon punches somebody and it, it's almost like an explosion. It's like, you know, this over the top sort of almost comical, I think maybe like this James Bond sort of. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely a license to do some things over the top. I mean, Hollywood guns or an yeah, example. Yeah, the guns, right. Uh, definitely punches and hits and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, I I tend to cut in that direction where I want it to sound big, mm -hmm. but not all the same too. So you got to be careful that everything doesn't just like, mm, 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 you know, these right. big low end punches. Right. You know, you got to make it varied. So so you would you would would you would use different samples? So it wouldn't be like oh, a yeah. like a round robin where you'd have a um, you know a small set of different samples that you would vary, or would you use a, a completely different sample for every single hit? It depends. I might have, I might find a file that has, say, four samples, and I like those four samples. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the main, say, meat of the punch. It's usually a layer of stuff, like right. two or three, or sometimes five sounds. So yeah, that, you know, like that, maybe that's the sound, main sound that I want to use and and be featured. So I'll use those four punches, and maybe vary them up, kind of like what you're saying, round robin. But I'm doing it manually, kind of right. picking which sounds that I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, it, it must must take a lot of patience to to go through each individual frame of the movie and have to like you know sync everything up i mean um what what's the kind of turnaround time on on something like that if it's a feature it can be months you have months to do it you know depending i mean it could be it's size depending on the size of the feature it could be a few weeks to you know months or even a year i mean there's some features that go on for a year so but I mean, when it's something drags on that long, it's usually like the main bulk of the material has been cut at that point. And, mm -hmm. you know, even after a few months, it's been cut and, uh, and you're just fine tuning and tweaking things right. from, that, from there. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you're when you're dealing with with um, with clients, how do you um, present the material to them? Would you uh, would you present it to them in a in a in a space that's. Five one, or would you take them into you know how, how would you would you show them that that uh, the the kind of 
the process? Would they always be? Would it always be presented in? You mean if I'm sa- like cutting sound effects? Yeah, I mean like if your show, if the director's coming in, like you know, just on a on a on a on a any given day, and they say, you know, so where are we with this? You know, would you would it always have to be in the that five one setting, or would you would a would a stereo image be enough? Because he, all he wants to see is you know that it's synced up not where it's going to be positioned in the cinema or you know are you still are you always yeah, thinking it, about it depends i mean sometimes you do need to present them like on a stage and let them hear in its full glory what it's going to sound like um it de- yeah it depends on how you know what their expectations are and you know if they're some people just don't have an imagination they they get if they hear it on an iphone or something they're not going to be able to imagine that it's going to sound bigger but yeah it really all depends i mean sometimes you mail out a stereo bounce down Mm -hmm. crash down of the mix of the say the edits if i'm editing sound effects i'll crash down a stereo and send it to them wherever Mm -hmm. they're at and they can listen to it right so all all you're concerned about it i'm I'm trying to get at the uh the process so like are you always thinking in terms of like how it's functioning as a whole or are you just thinking about the stages so at the moment i'm just syncing things up and i'm not really concerned about where it's gonna where it's gonna be positioned in relation to other things that are happening or yeah is that that a later stage at that point i am primarily constant like in my own world just kind of dealing with sound effects and Mm -hmm. and making trying to make it work as best as it can on its own you have to think that well you can't rely on music to carry everything Mm -hmm. you know there's going to be times and there's no music and you gotta you know you get to shine or or you know maybe it's just going to be a quiet scene and you need to have a really good solid background that's just creepy or whatever you know what i mean i mean you just got to make it all work as best as it can on its own and then you worry about like in the mix that's where you worry about when everything comes together right right so what is the uh what, what kind of technology are you using to to accomplish these things so what what would be your kind of DAW or how would you go about um you know cutting that cutting that sort of um up are you using kind of cubase or pro tools or what is it that you're using so the industry standard and my preference is pro tools Um, i've been on pro tools forever so it's basically what i know and what everybody in this industry pretty much knows i know there's some other stuff out there that can that are capable but none of it's the i you know the workflow just works really well between going between systems handing stuff off to other people Mm -hmm. um, locking up multiple systems for like when you go into a mix you know, where we have several systems locked up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just it's primarily Pro Tools in the whole industry. Right. So it's just a, a kind of one uniformity that everybody's reading from the same page. You yeah. know, type of thing. Right. Yeah, it makes sense because it's really really complex. Because composers tend to not work that way. They tend to have their whatever they were taught on or whatever they initially bought is like what their they, songwriting. Yeah, it's what they stay on. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Uh, and it tends to get a little bit kind of cross wires when they when they start delivering, do, uh, yeah, communicating and moving stuff through. It, it tends to not really. Um, there's problems can be. Can yeah, be, uh, and that's that's why you know we avoid because we've had people say work in other DAWs. I won't name any names, but then they try to deliver stuff to us, and it's uh, there's a lot of issues there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, things aren't where they're supposed to be, uh-huh. and, and there's files missing and all that business. Yeah. Um, so tell us, uh, is there any sort of um, like anecdotes or any experiences that you've that you've had that are sort of like of interest that, that might you might want to kind of talk about that um, you you've learned from or mistakes that you've made that you say ah. I wish I'd known that, you know, or the, the, that was a lesson learned type of thing. Um, I've definitely made mistakes, and I think y- you have to try not to let yourself get burned out, mm-hmm. and that's when mistakes start to happen. Right. I, a few years ago, got pretty burned out and made some mistakes that, you know, probably cost some money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had to fix a lot of them myself. And so it's like I, I, I ended up paying for it. <laughs> right, right, right. But, you know, you just got to be careful. Um, 
not yeah. to burn yourself out. Yeah, I mean, working in working in, in TV and film is extremely demanding. I mean, there, there's just there's always something happening. Something needs to be changed. That you know, right up until the the was it the, the ninth hour, there's always people are changing stuff and oh, uh, we've cut two seconds from from that 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 scene. You know, you need to go back and redo whatever it was that you've done. You know, and it's just it 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 it, it can be mentally exhausting and physically exhausting as well so i mean but in terms of um like uh technical um language you know what would you advise so for someone that was wanting to get into uh sound and 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 working uh in film you know would there be any tips or or directions or anything that you would you would say to somebody that is basically kind of starting from zero where where to focus their attention yeah i mean i think this that's a kind of a tough one now i mean when i started there was the internship program and i think that's harder to find now i think you still can so i would what i would do is probably go to school Mm -hmm. there's some good schools out there um but you know school doesn't really mean anything it's kind of getting your foot in the door right and then from there hopefully the school can connect you to maybe some studios to get mm-hmm. to get uh, an internship or a apprenticeship or whatever right. they call it these days. <laughs> I mean, like, but but in terms of um, you know familiarizing yourself with concepts, you know, you, you think school is the is the is the best way to go about doing that, like a formal uh, fixed structured education. No, I don't think that's the only way to go. But I feel like that's what everybody's going to be looking for. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't go to school for it. Right. So, but I think it's even harder now to get into it than it was even then. Because mm-hmm. um, there's just so many more people. There's, you know, everybody's going to school now. So like, you know, you got all these people coming out of school and they want to work in this, in this industry. And pretty much they know nothing. I mean, they know some basic concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, what I would say is have Pro Tools learn it in, inside and out as best as you can. Mm-hmm. Go on the various boards, gear sluts, yeah. the Avid uh, DUC or whatever they call it these yeah. days. Used to be digi- forums used to be Digidesign User Conference. That's how old I am. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, the forums, you know, there's mm-hmm. especially gear sluts, there's, there's pros on there. There's a lot of good uh, conversations that, yeah. that go on in there. What movies would you say that that's good? The sound design's good on that. As opposed to, or would you say everything across the board nowadays is is representative of the best? There's a lot of r- really good work these days, for sure. Um, but I would go back to say something like The Matrix was outstanding right. and and cutting edge at the time, and even to this day is influ- I would say is influential. Mm-hmm. Um, every aspect of that film is is very well done, you know, technically and and creatively. Yeah, even even musically, it's 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 extremely interesting um, mm-hmm. what, what's going on there. So the Matrix is kind of like the the bar. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the top ones. I mean, there's a there's a lot of you know Saving Private Ryan for military films. You right. know, that, that's way up at the top there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? I mean, there's so many. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I could go on for days listing films that I right. think have great soundtracks. I mean, what about like you know? Um, very very kind of minimal movies that, that don't really use a lot of of kind of heavy effects sure. driven stuff uh, a lot of the industry nowadays um there's a lot of independent stuff been made obviously with with le- lesser of a budget so they're focusing more on on storytelling and, and location they're getting a lot of their um their sound design and their and all that stuff from from where they're shooting, um, as opposed to trying to do it in post. So you know, I'm trying to think about how the landscape is changing um, as big studios are becoming less and less. Um, they're 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 playing it safe. You know what I mean? Um, if the if the movie's not gonna gonna gross more at the box office then they're not really interested in taking that right risk yeah if it's not hundreds of millions they're not interested yeah in. uh, or else you know if it hasn't got some sort of, like you feel i feel nowadays that um you know 
it's a lot of sort of remakes of the of the kind of thing. There's the 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 the, the storytellers, the the people that are actually kind of doing things that are interesting or existing in an, in another space these days. They're kind of on Netflix and and then you know they're they're on independent platforms that are. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard. I mean, you have n- almost no middle ground. Yeah, it's it's like you got the tent poles that the studios are making, and then you got these ultra low budget ones that right. that are. I mean, that's why I'm I'm not doing a whole lot of films these days. It's just it's more on the TV. TV, TV yeah. has budget, and that's where all the filmmakers are going is to TV. Right. Yeah, like many um, series, this mm-hmm. type of this type of Netflix thing. and Amazon. And yeah. Yeah, it's it's really kind of the way things are going. And that's that's what's pushing, I suppose, this market of the home cinema as a as a as a as a, like a tangible, realistic thing where people are investing in, like the the Atmos at home and the the surround sound at home and this type of thing. Because obviously the there's there's big titles been made, um, you know Netflix are, are producing content that are that's like you know, um, 5K or 4K and it's like super high quality and. The audio is moving to that space as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're doing Atmos. I know s- several. Uh... iTunes, for example, is is yeah. is is releasing, um, you know, that sort of Sonic. Um, you know, they've got the 4K titles now, the high res titles, and like they're almost like post Blu-ray type stuff. Yeah, was it the Apple TV as Atmos in yeah. it as well for yeah. sound? And you know, there's there's the, the the sound bar as well. I don't know if you've seen that the. The Atmos sound bar is just one, um, one solid device that projects. Yeah, I don't know if I'm too crazy about that idea, but <laughs> right, right, you still are kind of like you need the speakers placed relative to the to the audience member, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't say I've heard it, but I just I can't imagine it's. I mean, you know, I'm sure it does something, but how well it does it, it's to, I I got to check it out. Right, <laughs> I guess. right, right. And um, so, is there any sort of uh, is there any uh, concepts that you think we haven't really touched on that, that you think are is important to to speak about and when we're when we're talking about mixing or re-recording? Or is there any do's or don'ts that you would give to composers out there? Like, don't give me this. Do give me this. Yeah, I think definitely score and mix against the dialogue. You should listen to the dialogue, and also if you're if you are working in five one. Uh, keep the center pretty open when there's when there is dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have maybe some bleed in there, and and um, you know when when the dialogue stops, you can fill it in as you need is if needed. But uh, you know we like to have that. It's really hard to get dialogue intelligibility as it is, and you know if you have that center clear, then we can hug the music a little closer to the dialogue right. to fill yeah. that in. So that's one thing I can think of. Um, and and you know separation is is helpful mm-hmm. for sure you know don't lock everything up and think that you know you your mix is great and this is the way it's got to be and you don't you know you don't want anybody messing with it because right. that's only ultimately going to hurt you because the whole track will just get pulled down then you know yeah 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 the the whole thing is going to come down as opposed to just the yeah the brass. just the yeah yeah, yeah exactly it's like oh those those trumpets they're, they're they're sticking out you know pull the trumpets down no, no, no. We're pulling everything down, right? right. Or vice versa. Maybe there's times they want to why they want to push mm-hmm. a particular instrument. You know, like in Drag Me to Hell, we push the violin a lot. Or right. you know, and in various films I've worked on, it's you know the choir. You want to, that hovering above. You know, you want to mm-hmm. pan it to a different location, hover, hover it above you, so it kind of feels ethereal. And, right. You know what I mean? So you know, separation I think is really important, really helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, d- we don't always mess with it. It doesn't all. You know, but to have that option. Right. is is very helpful so it's just like give you guys as much flexibility to do what you yeah within reason you know we right. don't want 700 tracks of stuff but right right <laughs> what would you know you would you want 50 tracks would that be kind of where you would want yeah it be? all depends on right. what what it is and you know it's just just it's a discussion to have with the mixer mm-hmm. you know definitely talk to the mixer if you can right right um the, that's one of the problems with this industry is there is a lack of communication between different departments. Yes. You know, between production and post, there's no very little communication. Between you know music and sound effects, there's very little communication. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like there's this very little communication. So get involved as much as you can and right. and see if you can talk to these people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, reach out to the post supervisor and say, hey, can I talk to the 
you know, sound designer, can I talk to the re-recording mixer, yeah. whoever. And that goes, that goes again for pretty much from people who are working on pictures that have zero budget to your Avengers. You know, communication with all departments is always, not just the director or the producer, is, is always kind of helpful in terms of informing you as to what's... Yeah, I mean, I, I hear stories on bigger projects when... when when the composer and the sound effects, the sound designer get to communicate, and and that's great when that happens, but it's, it seems pretty rare that it happens. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the best kind of composers that, that worked with sound designers was Johan Johansson. Um, you know, the the score for Arrival was just absolutely wonderful in this sort of like, um, he took it really, really to this sort of new creative place where the, the, the score and the sound design were almost like inseparable you know um and his use of voices i think were were, was incredible in that score um you know so um it's just interesting to to talk about this type of aspect of of the job because coming from a from a composition point of view i it's something that i don't really think about is what's because you're so focused on actually writing the music that you never really think about where it's going to end up yeah and I think a couple things. I think get a music editor on your team, Mm -hmm. you know, someone that you work with regularly who knows your stuff and knows your material, and that person will represent you on the dub stage. It's rarely a good idea for the composer to come onto the dub stage. There's usually things can get heated. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, usually the composer's really in love with their own their stuff and really fighting for it and. And it gets to a point where it's just too much. So you know, it, it's really can be a hard battle on this on the stage. Um, you don't know. You can be angry at the re-recording mixer, but you don't know what transpired. You know, maybe the the maybe the director asked him to turn that down, or you know yeah. what I mean. It's like it's it's really a process, and it's a collaborative process with mm-hmm. many people involved. Right. And so it's rarely like one person that you can blame for, no, of course, for I mean, whatever. I mean, it typically, uh, the the, the kind of the story is that if uh, if the movie's bad, then the the composer tries to save it, and if the movie's good and it turns out bad, then the composer was the one that destroyed it, because the music is like this sort of it's the it's the kind of unspoken glue that that threads it all together. Um, you know, there's there's there are many people along the way that, that make that happen and, and contribute in their own way to to producing the finished product that we that we see in in the cinema. But um, you know, is there any is there any final final thoughts that you would that you, we haven't really touched on that you would want to speak about in terms of what you do um, on a day to day? Not really. I mean, these days I'm primarily mixing in television, which is a lot shorter turnaround. Mm-hmm. We don't really get time to pre-dub. Right. We, um, you know, it's two or three days for an episode to mix it and get it, out, you know, get it out the door. Right. And, um, you know, half of that is probably spent with the client mm-hmm. doing their, their notes, you know, or they're right, right, right. Uh, presenting to them and getting, you know, the producers or, or whoever's involved in the project. There's a lot of people involved in TV these days, too. Mm-hmm. You know, you have editors and directors and yeah. the showrunner and, you know. <laughs> I mean, TV is 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 the, the main format for, for storytelling these days. I mean, there's so much more content that's been produced. Yeah, for sure. TV, there's There's yeah. tons of content. It's getting better. There's definitely some really good content out there that's you know film quality, and there's yeah. a lot of filmmakers that are coming over to this uh, to, over to TV and and yeah. you know because they're getting different opportunities to tell stories, right. you know, and so it's exciting in that sense. Um, but the but the demand, the, the yeah. pressure is so much more because of the nature of the beast, right? Yeah, I mean, there's still a budget to to get things done, a budget and a timeline that things need mm-hmm. to get done in, and um, it's it's tough. <laughs> right. I mean, it's just it's it's about having that work ethic. It's about being able to just lock yourself down and 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 get the work done. I mean, that's in addition to having the actual know how and the skills to do the work. It's 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 that discipline that you have to go right. I'm going into this room for the next you know twelve hours and I'm not going to leave. <laughs> yeah, you li- you literally you know maybe get a lunch break and that's about it. You know, it's like you're working hard and it's barely 
a second to check my messages or right. my email. You don't see daylight for <laughs> yeah. you know two days. Like, oh, I came in and it was dark and I've left and it's dark. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's uh, that's but that's just the, the nature of the, of the beast, especially if you're if you're working in 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 television where um, it's so fast paced and. But the but the the demand of quality is the same cinema. I mean, you can't you can't for a second let that footstep be be out. You can't for a second let the the gunshot not meet the the, the trigger pull or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and we have we have level requirements as well. When it, it's got to be at a certain level, plus or minus two dB, and we can't right right for we broadcast. can't go over that. So yeah, that makes it tough too to make big things punch through. To make them sound really punchy, and then, but you're not necessarily thinking about that sort of five one seven one sound. Are you? Well, it's the, the sort of like television. No, we're, everything's pretty much five one, okay. except for a few, um, a few things like uh, a few bigger shows that uh, say um, Netflix and right. stuff like that are, are doing Atmos. Yeah. Okay, maybe so seven one here and there but mostly five one mm-hmm. i'd say primarily so that's still a standard even even in cinema or in, in television yes. as well All right so yeah. five one seven one is so if you're if you're a composer producer you want to be thinking about presenting you know that sort of five one mix to to your dub the dubbing engineer right yeah, I mean, we, we don't see 5.1 stuff as much. It's usually stereos right. that come in with a little bit of separation. It's not nearly as much separation as well as in the features. I mean, it depends on the project again. You know, it could be 10, say, 10 tracks of stuff, all stereos. Right. Uh, it's, it's, we see that often. It's, you know, maybe occasionally uh, there's a 5.0 orchestra or something. It really depends on the project. But if there's a budget for an orchestra, yeah, for that's instance. that's the thing. Is televisions kind of stand stereotypically not? They, they might have overdubs. There might be sweetening of some sort. For right. Exa- yeah. For example, composers all generally just deal with samples, mm-hmm. and then occasionally maybe get, you know, a small small violin section to come in and, and overdub, um, but they'll not have anything like. You know what's going on in, in the, the Newman scoring stage, or right. um, you know that sort of type of thing. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of work there, so I mean, I say embrace it, and um, that can be your calling card to the next thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, we've heard some good stuff, and we've heard some bad stuff, and it's like uh, often it's the stuff that interferes with dialogue is the problem right. most most of the time, right. or it's the wall to wall, just loud loud stuff. You right. know, wall to wall, like, and it's all mixed, like it's a music uh, CD, you know, it's like yeah. that, that Just compressed, the block, the block yeah. The big brick, yeah, so those are some things to watch out for, I mean, yeah, if, I mean, if that's you get into that, TV. Yeah, that's the thing, I mean, you can't say it enough, is that you stay out of the way of the dialogue or else you're, you're gone, like, it's out of there, there's no point, you may, you may as well never have written it, because <laughs> it's gone. Okay, so last the last thing is is that is there anywhere that people can find you online? Do you have like a like a place where people can kind of follow what you're doing or check out what you're what you're up to, Twitter or anything like that? Yeah, I'm not that involved in the online stuff. I mean, I sh- I mean I'm involved online, but not so much in the social network right. stuff. I mean, I have a Twitter account that I rarely post on. Right. That's at CJ Guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, all right. Not really, just look for me, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Let's look for you and check out your work. Um, all right, Chris, well, thanks very much. It was a really pleasure to chat to you, and uh, I'll definitely get, get through it again soon. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs>